Chronic pain doesn't just live in the body. It reshapes the brain. And here's what many don't realize. The brain doesn't care whether we label it physical or psychological. The circuits overlap. The suffering is real. So why, after decades of new medications, does pain so often become chronic? Why do patients who've tried opioids, gabapentinoids, antidepressants still hurt? That's what I want to unpack today. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant, psychiatrist, and educator. I work in pain medicine, and what I find is that solutions in chronic pain aren't just about stronger painkillers. They're about changing a brain that has adapted to a new state. In this video, I'm not going to drown you into every detail of pain neurobiology. There's already a huge literature on that. Instead, I'll cover the missing part. I'll reframe pain. Why it's not just physical or psychological, but predictive. How pain is tied to development, to emotion, and to safety. And how the most powerful treatments aren't just medications, but trust, connection, and meaning. Stay with me because later, I'll show you why human connection itself acts like an opioid potentiator. So let's start off with what pain really is. Pain is not the same as nociception, the perception of pain. Nociception is raw sensory input from nerves about injury. Pain is the brain's interpretation of that input as threat. We often divide pain into types. One, nociceptive pain tissue injury, burns, fractures, inflammation. Two, neuropathic pain, nerve injury, sciatica, diabetic neuropathy. And three, nociplastic pain, pain without clear tissue or nerve damage, where the central nervous system has reorganized itself. Think fibromyalgia or chronic widespread pain. Here's the nuance. The longer pain persists, the less it reflects the original injury and the more it reflects the brain's new state. So when patients ask me, why does my pain continue even though the injury is healed? The answer lies in how the brain predicts. So this is where we understand the brain as a prediction machine. You see, the brain is not a passive recorder of pain signals. It's a prediction machine. Acute pain says, I was unsafe. Chronic pain says, I am unsafe. Once that shift happens, even minor inputs, or none at all, can generate pain. Regions like the anterior cingulate cortex, insula, prefrontal cortex, amygdala, and somatosensory cortex integrate threat detection, salience, what grabs the brain's attention, and emotion. Pain is not just sensation, it is salience. And what that means is, it grabs attention. It alters emotion and it disrupts cognition. And these same circuits process psychological pain. The pain of rejection, betrayal, grief. That's why heartbreak and physical injury feel so similar in the brain. We'll come back to this. So why does pain persist when tissues heal? There are three big mechanisms. First, central sensitization. Here, neurons in the spinal cord and brain become hyper excitable amplifying signals. Two, failure of descending inhibition. You see, normally the prefrontal cortex and the brainstem dampen pain signals. In chronic pain, this system weakens. Third, neuroinflammation. Immune mediators and glia sustain excitability. The result, pain signaling grows larger than the injury itself. So when we understand pain from a broader perspective, and applied in clinical practice, we get statements like this. My pain used to be eight out of 10. Now it's four, but it doesn't bother me anymore. That change isn't about erasing nociception. It's about shifting the meaning the brain gives to pain. You see, the experience of pain is integrated into our personality development. Engel in 1959 argued, pain is central to the self. As children, pain teaches us. Who responds when I cry? Who do I trust? Does pain lead to comfort or neglect? These early experiences are varied and they form templates for each one of us. Over time, pain becomes a language. It shapes how we ask for care, how we approach doctors, how we use medications. 
That's why early relational pain, rejection, betrayal, trauma, can echo later in physical pain. Because they share the same brain templates. Pain circuits overlap with circuits of mood, trauma, and stress. The medial pain pathway links to the salience and stress networks. And here's a paradox. You can have pain without suffering. You can suffer without pain. Context changes everything. For example, erotic pain may not cause suffering because it's reframed as safe. But grief or rejection can feel unbearable. So when someone says heartbreak feels like physical pain, it's not metaphor, it's neurobiology. So this is where it becomes important to understand medications and their limitations. Opioids, they dampen nociception, the perception of pain, but they can't erase suffering. Antidepressants, they strengthen descending inhibition. Gabapentinoids such as pregabalin or gabapentin, they reduce excitability and results are mixed. Ketamine modulates glutamate and alters salience networks. Medications matter. They mainly bring relief. They lower the volume, but they don't change the predictive state of the brain. That's why patients often say, medications help, but the pain's still there. So here's the crux. Chronic pain is the brain in a state of, I am unsafe. So treatment isn't only about dampening nociception, it's about restoring safety for the brain. Now this is often where stigma enters the room. Many patients tell me, but I'm not depressed. Why do I need to see a psychiatrist? Or this isn't in my head, and they're right. It's not in their head. But for the brain, labels like depression, anxiety, or chronic pain don't matter. What matters is whether key domains of functioning have shifted. In teaching, I use the PACES framework. P, perception, the way the body and the environment are interpreted. A, activity, energy, drive, motor output. C, cognition, attention, planning, flexibility. E, emotional hedonics, regulation, fear, anger, despair, the ability to derive pleasure from our environment. And S, sleep, architecture, rhythm, repair. In chronic pain, every one of these domains is altered. Perceptions become threat-focused. Activity drops or becomes erratic. Cognition narrows with rumination dominating. Emotions spiral, often towards fear, guilt, or anger, making it difficult to derive pleasure from our surroundings. And sleep is disrupted, fueling the cycle further. This is why psychiatry should not be neglected in pain medicine. It's not about a label. It's about understanding that pain has already changed the brain. Psychiatric medications play a role here, not to fix pain, but to stabilize central circuits. For example, antidepressants strengthen descending inhibitory pathways. Certain agents reduce rumination or hyperarousal. They create the stability needed for the brain to adapt, to relearn safety. But, and this is crucial, medications are only part of the process. They buy time, they reduce intensity, they create a window for neural adaptation. The real transformation comes from rebuilding predictability and safety. Here are the key principles. First, predictability and control, so that brain learns to downregulate threat. Two, enhancing the emotional vocabulary, reframing pain as a signal, not an enemy. Three, family education, teaching loved ones to validate, not reinforce disappointment. Four, Activity pacing in the Goldilocks zone. Not too much, not too little, but just enough to foster neuroplastic change. And fifth, therapeutic alliance and psychiatric support. Reducing arousal overload, calming rumination and restoring agency. I've seen patients taper off fentanyl, not because their pain disappeared, but because their relationship to pain transformed. The body didn't change overnight. The brain changed its state and with it, the meaning of pain changed too. Now I want to touch on one of the most neglected treatments, the therapeutic alliance. When a patient feels heard, validated and trusted, their brain literally recalibrates. Consistency reduces surprise. Validation reduces prediction errors. Trust builds safety. The alliance itself lowers hypervigilance. You see, connection itself is an analgesic. Social touch, empathy, eye contact, 
These activate endogenous opioid and oxytocin systems. Loneliness, by contrast, heightens pain perception. Rejection worsens pain sensitivity. Human connection potentiates pain relief. It literally boosts the effectiveness of analgesic medications. So when a doctor listens, when a family member holds a hand, that isn't symbolic. It's opioid potentiation in real time. Pain is fundamentally about meaning. It tells the brain, this matters, pay attention, survive. Acute pain acts as a survival signal. But when pain becomes chronic, the meaning loop has altered. It no longer signals danger, it signals perpetual unsafety. Reframing pain means reframing meaning. It means shifting from fear and avoidance to safety and agency. So what works? Integration. Medications provide relief. Therapy recalibrates meaning and prediction. Connection provides safety and potentiates natural opioids. Activity pacing rebuilds body maps. Psychoeducation reframes pain as a signal, not an enemy. It's not one intervention, it's the aggregation of marginal gains across brain and body. For clinicians who want to know what that means, check out our course by Professor Michael Burke on the aggregation of marginal gains in psychiatry. If you only remember one thing from this video, it's this. Pain is not physical or psychological. It's the brain's prediction of threat. Relief is possible, but true transformation comes when the brain learns safety again. If you'd like to go deeper, explore our academy courses where we break down neuropsychiatry and pain in ways that help clinicians reframe treatment. Because once you see pain this way, you'll never treat it the same again. I'm Dr. Sinal Rege, and thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.